If you need to pass GED Social Studies and have a lot riding on this test, know that this beginner's guide will help get you started off on a strong note here so that you can pass faster and move ahead to bigger and better things. It's important to understand the difference between a fact and an opinion for your test. Now, what you should know here is that facts can be proven true, but opinions are beliefs or views that can't be proven true. Now, these are two basic points here, and I think that a lot of GED test takers often understand the difference between a fact and an opinion, but sometimes the way questions are worded uh, and the way things are just worded on your test can make these questions trickier. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at some basic examples here, and we're going to move on to some trickier ones. Um, and so hopefully you can take away something from this segment of the video that will help you get more questions right and a higher score on your test. So first, let's start off with... Pittsburgh is a city in Pennsylvania. I'd like you to pause the video and think about, is this a fact or an opinion? And when you're ready, unpause the video and we'll talk about it. So this is a fact, and hopefully this was a pretty simple example here. Um, don't worry if it wasn't, that's what you're here to do. You're here to learn. Um, but hopefully this one was fairly straightforward here. Uh, the way to tell if this is a fact or an opinion is, can you verify this? Well, you can look on a map, or you could travel out to Pennsylvania and see Pittsburgh. You could uh, just Google it and do a little research, but we could verify that this is a true statement here. This is a fact, this isn't a feeling. Okay, so the next example is Pittsburgh is a fun city to live in. Now again, I'd like you to pause the video, take all the time you need to decide if this is a fact or an opinion, then when you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, this is an opinion. Now, I used to live in Pittsburgh, and it's my opinion that it is a fun city to live in, but not everybody thinks that. Some people might not think it's a fun city. Some will think it's a fun city. It's just an opinion or a feeling. It's not something you can prove or disprove. So hopefully these were two straightforward examples. Here's another one for you. Trenton is the capital of New Jersey. Now, I'd like you to pause the video and think about this. Is this a fact or an opinion? And when you're ready, unpause it and we'll go over it. Okay, so this is a fact. So again, this is something that we could prove to be true. You could do a little research, maybe look on a map, um, but you could verify that Trenton is the capital of New Jersey. This is not someone's feeling or belief. This is something we can prove to be true. Okay, Hawaiian pizza is the best kind of pizza. So again, let's have you pause the video, try this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over it. Now this is an opinion, and again, this happens to be my opinion. I think some pineapple, some ham on there, that is my favorite type of pizza, but other people might like pepperoni or mushroom or whatever better. It's totally an opinion. There's no right or wrong answer. Uh, this isn't something you can prove to be true. So hopefully these several examples here have been uh, pretty straightforward. Like I said, don't worry if you've had trouble with these so far. We're here to learn and get better. Um, but now we're going to look at something that might be a little trickier. Um, depending on where you're at with your GED studying. But the next example says, Parker said that Hawaiian pizza is the best kind of pizza. So I'd like you to pause the video. Take all the time you need to think about this. Is this a fact or an opinion? So this is similar to the last one, um, but there's a little twist here. Let's see if you can get this right. Okay, hopefully you had a chance to try this out. In this case, this is a fact. Now, it is my opinion that Hawaiian pizza is the best kind of pizza. Okay, but if the statement is just saying Parker said this, okay, this includes part of my opinion here, but but it's just telling me here that Parker said this, and then it includes my opinion. The fact that I said that opinion is a fact. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, a little tricky to explain this, uh, but basically it's just, again, it's saying Parker said, and then it, it lists my opinion here that Hawaiian pizza is the best kind of pizza. So the statement does contain my opinion, but the overall statement is a fact. It's just reporting on the fact that I said this. So the next one is the government should increase spending for fixing potholes in the roads. Is this a fact or an opinion? I'd like you to pause the video, take all the time you need, and then we'll go over it when you're ready. Okay, so this is an opinion, and the word should uh, is a little clue here that this is an opinion. Words like, uh, you know, the government should do this or this person should do that. Should do that. Uh, the word should is often a clue that a statement is an opinion. So here's the next one. Judy stated that the government should increase spending for fixing potholes in the road. So is this a fact or an opinion? Let's have you think about this, and when you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, so 
This is kind of like the one where I said that Hawaiian pizza is the best kind of pizza. This is a fact. Now, it's Judy's opinion that the government should increase spending for fixing potholes in the roads. It's just saying here, Judy stated, and then it lists Judy's opinion here. So this statement overall is a fact. It's just reporting on something that Judy stated. It's reporting that Judy stated her opinion, but the statement overall is still a fact. Okay, so here's another one. This is another little trickier example. Uh, at least some people might think so. It says here, researchers believe we will have a cure for cancer by 2030. Is this a fact or is this an opinion? Pause the video and when you're ready, we'll go over it. So basically this is an opinion and here's why. Uh, a prediction about anything is generally going to be considered an opinion. Um, this is a, a prediction about something that's happening in the future and we can't prove right now if this is going to be true or false, right? Now, what could trip people up here is it says researchers believe this. Researchers believe we will have a cure for cancer by 2030. Now, you know, if an expert or a researcher believes something, you know, is going to happen in the future, that is still an opinion. Now, it might be an informed opinion, right? The researchers might have an informed opinion, an educated opinion on something based off of what they know about science. But since it's a prediction about something in the future, uh, it's not something we can prove right now. We would still consider this an opinion. So just file this away that a prediction is considered an opinion. Okay, so here's another one. The report argues that an additional stop sign is necessary on 3rd and Delaware Street. So as always, you can pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so this is an opinion, and the word argues can sometimes be a clue that a statement is an opinion here, right? Like if I were to argue and say that Hawaiian pizza is the best kind of pizza and not pepperoni, and I were to argue about that, that would be my argument, that would be my opinion. All right, so words like argues are typically going to be a clue that a statement is an opinion. So Hopefully you're getting the basic idea. You know, like I said, you might get some questions asking if something is a factor or an opinion on your test. Sometimes the wording can be tricky and sometimes, you know, the quotes or whatever they're using. Sometimes, let me just say this, sometimes the wording can be confusing on the test. You know, just go with your gut, just stick to the basics and just remember these kind of trickier cases and hopefully if you see something like it on the test, hopefully you'll remember how to get those questions right. Okay, so now let's talk about how to beat questions that ask you, what does the word mean here? And for this, I am going to tell you what I call the substitution method. And it's not a foolproof method. It's just kind of a way to help you think through these questions. Now, let's start by reading this passage here. It says, but when barter ceases and money has become the common instrument for commerce, every particular commodity is more frequently exchanged for money than for any other commodity. The butcher seldom carries his beef or his mutton to the baker or the brewer in order to exchange them for bread. But he carries them to the market where he exchanges them for money and afterwards exchanges that money for bread. The quantity of money which he gets for them regulates to the quantity of bread which he can afterwards purchase. Question, what does the word barter mean in the passage above? A, music, B, trade, C, community, D, travel. So I'd like you to pause the video. You might have to reread this or at least reread parts of it. And when you're ready, unpause it and we'll talk about this. Okay, so one strategy to get this question right would be to just find the word barter, which it's bolded here, and just kind of read the sentence or read part of the sentence in your head because you won't be able to talk on your exam, right? Um, but just read it and just kind of substitute each word in in place of barter and just kind of see which one sounds right, all right? Like I said, this is not an exact science. It's not always gonna work, but sometimes if you're just stuck on a question, you can just kind of read it like this in your head. You would read, but when music ceases and money has become the common instrument of commerce, blah, blah, blah. But when trade ceases and money has become the common instrument of commerce. But when community ceases and money has become the common instrument of commerce. But when travel ceases, and money has become the common instrument of commerce. So basically what I am doing, like I just said, you're just kind of reading the sentence, uh, you know, read the sentence or even read part of the passage in your head, but place each word in place of barter. And sometimes if you do this, like the right answer will just kind of jump out at you. Like I said, that's not a guarantee, 
Um, but that's one way to do it using the substitution method. And it's also just helpful to look for similar words, right? Now, you might not know what barter means, okay? And that's kind of what the question's asking you about here. But basically, if you kind of go through the example here, you can just think, well, there's nothing about music mentioned in this example, so I can take music out. Now, community, you might think, okay, well, we're talking about a butcher, and the butcher is exchanging things with, like, other shop owners, so maybe community could work. Travel, well, maybe the butcher's traveling to different places, so maybe travel could work. But if you really think about it, all right, think about the word in order to exchange and what, what's going on here, right? So it, it's basically saying that the butcher is not just going to take the beef and go directly to a baker and trade the beef for bread. What's probably going to happen is the butcher is going to go to the market, is going to trade the uh, the beef at the market, get some money, then go back to the baker and give the money to the baker in exchange for the bread. All right. So in other words, he is going to be, you know, he's not going to directly trade his beef to the baker. What he's probably going to do is he's going to go trade or exchange that beef for money. Then he's going to take the money and go back to the baker. That's really what this is saying here. So, you know, the words like exchange is basically a similar, it's really a very similar meaning to the word trade. Trade and exchange are kind of two ways of saying the same thing. Um, and so you'd hopefully just kind of either just keep reading it and just hearing, um, just trying to hear which word sounds best in your head. That sometimes works. But also you just kind of have to dig down and just reason your way through these questions too. And kind of a combination of just reasoning your way through them and just, you know, kind of substituting words in and seeing if something jumps out at you. What hope you hopefully help you get B as the correct answer here. Okay, so the next passage says, the nations that according to the best authenticated history appear to have been first civilized were those that dwelt round the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. That sea by far the greatest inlet that is known in the world, having no tides or consequence, consequently any waves except such as are caused by the wind only, was by the smoothness of its surface, as well as by the multitude of its islands and the proximity of its neighboring shores, extremely favorable to the infant navigation of the world, when from their ignorance of the compass, men were afraid to quit the view of the coast, and from the imperfection of the art of shipbuilding, to abandon themselves to the boisterous waves of the ocean. So the question says, what does the word nations mean in the passage above? A. Study of past events. B. Territories led by the same government. C. Conquest. Or D. Expedition. So let's have you pause the video. Take all the time you need. Maybe you reread this or at least part of it if you have to. Then when you're ready, we'll go over this. Okay, so again, you know, there's a combination of, you know, the substitution method and also just kind of reasoning your way through this is usually a good way to go through these. So if you just kind of, you know, read the sentence, the nations that, according to the best authenticated study of past events, appears to have been first civilized. The nations that, according to the best authenticated territories led by the same government, appear to have been first civilized. The nations that, according to the best authenticated conquest, appear to have been first civilized. The nations that, according to the best authenticated expedition, appear to have been the first civilized, blah, blah, blah. So what I'm doing here again, just to explain the strategy, I'm going to just kind of, you know, and you might want to read more than just that. I'm just, for the sake of time, I'm only reading the first part of the sentence. But the substitution method, again, is to find that word in the passage. It says history. And in your head, because you can't talk on the exam, you just take each answer choice and you substitute it in place of the word history. And you just read the sentence or read, you might have to read a sentence or two into the paragraph, but just substitute each answer choice in here in your head like I just showed you how to do out loud. And sometimes, you know, something will just feel right. You'll just kind of get a gut feeling like, hey, this sounds right. And you won't, even if you're not sure exactly why, you know, if you have nothing else to go off of, you know, you might just get, you know, your gut might just cue you into what are the answers being right just by substitution into the passage, all right? Um, and so you can do that. And just by kind of common sense, you're just reasoning your way through it. Hopefully you would come up with A as the answer here. So for these questions, again, you know, you just kind of have to take your time just think critically, common sense, and also try that substitution method. Sometimes that does help. There's three branches of government. There's a legislative branch, a, an executive branch, and a judicial branch. Now, the legislative branch consists of Congress, which is the, made up of the Senate and the House of Representatives. Now, the executive branch includes the president, 
And the judicial branch consists of the Supreme Court, and the judicial branch basically interprets the law. Now, I should also point out that this is, there's a lot more to know about this topic. This is a really broad and complicated topic, and I'm just giving you the simplified version of what I think you should know for the GED test, all right? So there's, there's so when you see these two bullet points on the slide, note that, you know, you could, there's a lot more to know about the judicial branch than just this, but for the purposes of the test, this is what I think you should know. Okay, so now let's talk about how a bill becomes a law. So basically, someone gets an idea for a law. Then they're going to contact their senator or representative, whoever it happens to be, and that person is going to decide to write a bill. So next, the bill will be introduced by either a representative or senator into the House or Senate. So for the sake of an example, let's say that somebody gets an idea for a new law, and they go and talk to their local senator, and their senator introduces the bill. The Senate, senator is going to take that bill to the Senate, and there's going to be debate and discussion and then a vote. Now, if the majority of senators vote in favor of the bill, it's then going to move on to the House, where the representatives will also discuss the bill and vote on it. All right. So, on the other hand, though, maybe let's say that a citizen gets an idea for a law, and instead of taking it to their local senator, they go to the representative. Well, it's the same process. That representative would introduce the bill into the House of Representatives. There'd be debate and discussion and a vote. And if the majority of representatives uh, vote in favor of it, it would then go on to the House, or I'm sorry, it would then go on to the Senate, where the senators would also discuss it and vote on it. So when I talk about the two chambers in Congress, of Congress, note that one chamber would be the Senate, the other chamber would be the House. So the, the key idea here to understand is that somebody gets an idea for a law, they'll take it to either a senator or representative. If it goes to a senator, the Senate votes on it. If the majority of senators vote on it, then it goes to the House. And vice versa, if the person gets an idea for a law and takes it to their local representative, then that person can introduce it to the House of Representatives. If they vote in favor of it, it then goes on to the Senate. All right, so there's two chambers here. They both have to vote in favor of it. Now, if both chambers vote in favor of it, the next step is that the bill will go to the president, and the president can either approve the bill or reject the bill. And rejecting a bill is called a veto. Now, if the president vetoes the bill, it will go back to Congress, and if a two-thirds majority vote in favor of the bill, it will become a law. Now, the president can also defer or put off making a decision on the bill temporarily, but the bill will eventually automatically still become a law after 10 days if the president takes no action, uh, if the Congress is in session. So again, this is, you know, there's a lot to this topic, a lot more to this topic, um, but this is simplified what I think you should know for the test. And let's see, now let's test your understanding here. And if you get this wrong, don't worry about it. I just want to give you a pop quiz here. Just by answering this question, it's going to help you hopefully help this information stick a little bit better. So true or false? The process of creating a federal law involves one branch of government. So pause the video. Think about this. If you'd like to, you could maybe rewind the video and rewatch that last segment of it until you find the answer. And then we'll go over it. So this is false here, right? Remember, the process of creating a federal law involves the Congress, and then if the Congress, if both chambers vote in favor of the bill, it will go to the president. So technically, two branches are involved here, the legislative branch and the executive branch. Another common type of question that comes up on GED Social Studies is putting events in a passage in order. So they'll give you a a passage like this, it might be about the same length. It could be shorter, it could be longer. Uh, there's no guaranteed way to know. Um, and then they'll give you a list of events from that passage or paragraph, and they will mix the events up and want you to put them in the correct order. So let's read this, and uh, then I'll give you a chance to go over it. So it says, The Louisiana Purchase was the acquisition of Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, North Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, Oklahoma, and much of the land in Minnesota, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, and Kansas from France by the United States in 1803. When the United States was founded, the Americans controlled the territory east of the Mississippi River and north of New Orleans. Spain, who controlled New Orleans, signed a treaty with the U.S. in 1795, which allowed the Americans to use New Orleans Spain halted Americans' use of New Orleans a few years later, but restored it in 1801. 
power over the territory was transferred from Spain to France in 1803. Roughly three weeks later, France ceded the territory to the United States. So this should really have a little apostrophe here, right? Technically, if you want to be grammatically correct. Uh, but anyway, it says, Please place the following events in the correct order according to the passage. Spain restored American use of Orleans. Uh, Spain permitted American use of New Orleans. The United States purchased the territory from France. Spain disallowed American use of New Orleans. And France purchased the territory from Spain. So I'd like you to pause the video. There's no multiple choice for this because I can't fit it on the screen. And just kind of tell me, uh, what would which event would happen first, second, third, fourth, and fifth? So pause the video, take all the time you need, and when you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, so in questions that ask you to put events in order, what can sometimes be tricky is that they'll give you extra information that uh, they'll give you a lot of information in the passage that might not uh, even show up in the events you're being asked to put in the correct order. So you kind of have to just kind of find the stuff in the, the passage. Just kind of take your time with it. Um, but what I'm seeing first here is, is Spain, who controlled New Orleans, signed a treaty with the U.S. Uh, to allow them to use New Orleans, right? So it looks like the first thing I see is that Spain permitted uh, American use of New Orleans. So I would say that's number one. Then the next sentence says Spain halted American use of New Orleans, meaning, you know, they said that they stopped American from using it. Americans from using it, so next would be Spain disallowed American use of New Orleans. Um, but then it says in the same sentence, but restored it in 1801. So the first three events were the Spain permits American use of New Orleans, then they stop allowing use of New Orleans, and then in 1801 they restore use of New Orleans, so here's one, two, and three. Okay, so the last sentence, or the last two sentences say power over the territory was transferred from Spain to France. Roughly three weeks later, France ceded the territory to the United States. So basically, what happened was France bought the territory from Spain, right? Because Spain owned the territory. So this would be four. And then once France had it, shortly, very shortly after, then uh, the United States bought that territory from France. So this would be the correct order of events. Hopefully that makes sense. You know, there's not really uh, a trick to these questions. You just kind of have to take your time, go slow, uh, and just reason your way through them. Um, and, you know, just remember that there's often going to be information in the passage that's not necessarily going to be helpful. Now, certainly don't uh, neglect anything. Don't overlook anything if you're having trouble. Sometimes it might help to just reread the whole passage. But, um, you know, for the purposes of answering this, you know, really, we can, can't cross out, you know, really the first really the first half of this paragraph here doesn't really have much to do with answering the question. It's just extra information that's added in here. So just keep in mind that you, you don't always need all the information to answer the question. Sometimes you might, just depends on the case, but in this case, we didn't need it. So here's another example, and I think this one's a little bit more challenging. It says, U.S. President Thomas Jefferson had an interest in exploring the western frontier long before the territory was acquired in the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson asked Congress to fund the expedition during the second year of his presidency. Captain Meriwether Lewis and Second Lieutenant William Clark commanded the Corps of Discovery during the expedition. While the Corps of Discovery departed from Camp Du Bois in Illinois, Lewis first left from Pittsburgh, where he sailed down the Ohio River and met Clark in Kentucky. In preparation for the journey after the Louisiana Purchase, Lewis studied medicine in Philadelphia. So we have below the question, which event happened third? And we've got a list of events, and of course they are out of order. Uh, a says, Lewis departed from Pittsburgh. B, Clark met Lewis in Kentucky. C, Lewis studied medicine in Philadelphia. D, the Corps of Discovery left from Camp Du Bois in Illinois. E, President Thomas Jefferson had an interest in exploring the Western frontier. So I'd like you to pause the video, take all the time you need to work on this, and tell me which of these events, A, B, C, D, or E, happened third. Okay, so the first thing to think about here is the first sentence right off the bat tells us that Jefferson had an interest in exploring the western frontier uh, long before the Louisiana Purchase territory was acquired. So actually the first thing that takes place here is that Jefferson had that interest in exploring the frontier. So what happened second? Well, you might actually be, uh, you might actually have been confused about this, and it's okay if you were. Um, it says Lewis studied medicine in Philadelphia. That is actually the second thing that happened here. And if you got that, that's a really good job. 
really good work. And if you didn't get it, don't worry. We're just learning right now uh, to help you get better for your test. But basically, it tells us that in preparation for the journey after the Louisiana Purchase, he studied medicine in Philadelphia. So after the Louisiana Purchase, so if this event took place after the Louisiana Purchase, that means that it would have to have taken place after Jefferson had an interest in exploring the western frontier. But it was before the journey because it tells us in preparation for the journey. So this was after the Louisiana Purchase, but before they left for the journey. So one is E, and then the second thing that happens is that Lewis goes and studies medicine. All right, so that's a little bit of a curveball. I put that at the end of the paragraph here, um, you know, just to make the question more challenging because, you know, the events are going to be scattered out all out of order, and that's really the whole challenge is to figure out how to put them in the right order here. So what does happen third? We've got departing from Pittsburgh, Clark meeting Lewis in Kentucky, and the core of discovery leaving from Du Bois. Well, this sentence here, right, this kind of cluster of information that we get here, uh, hopefully is going to illuminate this for us here. So it tells us that while the Corps of Discovery departed from Camp Du Bois, or Du Bois in Illinois, however you pronounce that, um, so basically, in other words, they did leave from uh, Illinois, but before, Lewis first left from Pittsburgh, and then after leaving Pittsburgh, he sailed down the Ohio River and met Clark in Kentucky. And then, you know, we have to read between the lines here. Eventually, after the Pittsburgh event, after the Kentucky event, then they left from Illinois. So really, the order would be third would be A, he departs from Pittsburgh. Fourth would be they met Lewis in Kentucky. And then the last thing would be that they um, they left from Camp Du Bois in Illinois. So the correct answer here is A. And if you got this one right, then really good job. Um, if you if you struggled with this one or didn't get it right, don't worry about it. If we're just practicing right now. You know, no pressure at all. I just hope that this is a learning experience for you. The most important thing is I want you to pass the test and I want you to be able to get ahead and move on to whatever's coming next for you after the GED. So it's all about the learning right now. So absolutely, there's no shame in getting a question wrong while we're just practicing. Okay, so now we see a graph. It says Austin, Texas metro area population from 2005 to 2018. And over here on our vertical axis, we see the population. We see numbers from 500,000 up to 2 million. Now down here, we see the years from 2006 going to 2018. And the question is, what is the best estimate for the population size in 2012? Is it A, 2 million, B, 1,500,000, C, 500,000, or D, 100,000? So I'd like you to pause the video. Try your best on this, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so this is a question we're working on skills right now in laying a foundation um, to get you started here with your uh, social studies studying here. So you probably won't get a question that is, you'll probably get a question harder than this on the test. All right, but we're, we're building basic skills here, and this is an important skill to know. So what you would do to answer this question is find down here on the axis that is labeled year, You'd want to find 2012, all right? So I find 2012, and I'm going to trace straight up until I hit the line. Now, obviously, you're not going to be able to write on the computer screen, but you can do this with your eyes. So I go all the way up until I connect with the blue line. And right where I connect with the blue line, I'm now going to change direction, and I'm going to trace to the left until I hit the population. All right, so I hit the population or the axis that's labeled population over here, and I see that I connect with the number 1,500,000. Now again, you won't be able to draw on the screen like this on your test, so with your eyeballs, you would just do the same thing. You find 2012, follow with your eyes up here to where you would connect on the blue line, then go left until you hit your population number over here, which here it's five, it's 1,500,000, one so B is the right answer here. All right, so we just want to keep building these basic skills. Okay, so the next question says, what is the best estimate for the population size in 2014? A, 2 million, B, 1,500,000, C, 1,600,000, or D, 1,900,000. So I'd like you to pause the video, take your time with this as always, and then we'll go over it. And hey, if you get stuck, don't worry about it. We're here to learn to help you get better so you can pass your test. So no sweat right now. I just want you to get some practice in. So go ahead, you can try it now. Okay, hopefully you had a chance to try this if you'd like to. So this time we're gonna look for the population in 2014. 
So the first step is I look down here at my years and I find 2014. So with my on test, you're gonna do this with your eyes, but I'm just gonna trace right now um, because we're just learning how to do this. But obviously you can't actually write on the test and I'm gonna trace all the way up from 2014 until I connect with the blue line. So right here, I'm gonna make a little dot showing that this is where I'm connecting with the blue line. So what's the next step? I am going to trace directly and this line's not perfectly straight, but imagine I'm going straight over here, all the way over here. And this time I don't connect directly with a value. So this is where estimation comes in, all right? So you can see that my line is above 1,500,000, or I'm sorry, 1,500,000. So we know that B is the right, is wrong because B is gonna be too low. But we also see that my line is quite a ways beneath 2 million. So I'm gonna take out 2 million and that leaves us with C or D. Is it 1,600,000 or D, 1,900,000? Well, if you think about it, we see that our population value is gonna be something between 2 million and 1,500,000. However, we also see that that value is much closer to 1,500,000 than it is to 2 million. So our estimate, to estimate this, we wanna pick a value that is closer to 1,500,000 because our value is something closer to 1,500,000, oops, as compared to 2 million. So C is the correct answer here. So now we have a new graph and it says GDP growth percent in Georgia between 1996 and 2004. We see on the left GDP growth percent from zero up to 12, and we see years from 1996 to 2004. And the question says, what was the trend between 2000 and 2001? Increase, decrease, or no change? So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go over this. So first, what we need to do for a question like this is we need to find between 2000 and 2001 on the graph. So if we look at the years, this is 2000, all right? So I'm just gonna draw a straight line up here. Now, 2001 is gonna be directly in between 2000 and 2002. So right here would be 2001. All right, so this is 2001, although it's not labeled, you just have to look in between the two and you'll see that this is 2001. So basically, the only spot on the graph that I need to look at for this question is the blue line in between these two bars that I drew, all right? So nothing over here is gonna help me with the question. Nothing over here is gonna help me with the question. I just have to focus on what's happening with the blue line in between these black bars. And again, obviously you can't draw these lines on the test, so you'll just have to do this with your eyes. Um, but basically, what I see here is a line, and if I imagine a little stick person is going to start on the line here and is just going to follow the line, would they be going uphill or downhill? Well, if they follow this line, you can see that they're going uphill. All right, so the answer here is increase. And what I want you to take away from this question is a line that looks like this would be showing increase, all right? Like if you imagine this was a hill and a little stick figure person was going to start here at the bottom, or right here at the leftmost portion. If they were just gonna follow the direction of the line, they'd be going uphill. All right, now a line like this, on the other hand, let me make that down here a little bit more. For a line like this, if you imagine a person starting at the leftmost portion of the line, if that person was going to follow the line, all right, and just follow the line, which direction would they be going? Well, they'd be going downhill. So a line that looks like this shows a decrease, all right? Now at the same time, now this line's not perfectly straight because of my drawing skills, but imagine this was like a perfectly straight line. If the stick figure person were to start at the leftmost portion of this line, and if they were to follow the line, they would, would not be going uphill, they would not be going downhill, they would just be going straight, all right? So if you saw a scenario like this, that would be no change. Now, all of this is going to be true as long as if you look at the y-axis or the vertical axis, if the numbers are increasing from bottom to top, 
and at the same time, if the numbers are getting bigger going from left to right, which the majority of cases, I would say I would bet almost every single case, if not every case on the GED, so you're going to have numbers increasing uh, from bottom to top and from left to right. All right, so as long as you have that, the numbers are going up and are going up from bottom to top and going up from left to right then a line like this is always going to be an increase and a line like this will always be decreased. So for the test, I'd be very surprised if you don't get a case where the numbers are going up, starting from bottom to top and increasing from left to right. All right, so whenever that's true, this kind of line is going up, this kind of line is going down, this kind of line would be staying still. Okay, so the next question says, what was the trend between 2003 and 2004? Increase, decrease, or no change? So let's have you pause the video. As always, give this one a try, and then we're just going to go over it. Okay, so first here, what we would have to do is let's find 2003. So I'm going to look at 2002 and 2004, and right in between here is where we find 2003. So I'm just going to draw a straight line here. And again, you won't be able to draw on the screen, um, but you can do this with your eye. You're just going to follow with the eye on the test, and 2004 is right here. So why am I drawing these black bars here? Well, I'm doing that just to direct your attention to the part of the blue line in between the bars. So you could cross everything out on this graph. Cross everything out except what's in between the two bars. So if we focus just between the two bars, all right, and we imagine the person is gonna start at the leftmost portion of the blue line, and if this person is gonna follow the line, which direction are they be going? are they going to be going? Well, they'll be going downhill, which means a decrease. So again, a line like this will be decrease, a line like this will be increase, and a flat line like this will be no change. So here's another question. What was the overall trend between 1996 and 2004? Increase, decrease, or no change? So as always, I'll hand it over to you to give this one a try, and then we'll go over it. Okay, hopefully you had a chance to pause the video and try this out. Let's talk about this one. So this time we need to look between 96, which would be right here, and 2004, which would be over here. Now, in this case, there's nothing to cross out. We're just basically looking at the entire graph here. Okay, and so what I want you to see here is that they're in between 96 and 2004. There were certain times when the GDP was decreasing, like right here. And there were also times when it was increasing, like we see right here, all right, and right here. So there's certain times when there was decrease, there's certain times when there was increase. But if we start at 1996 and we start here at 2004, okay, what you can see is that the GDP was close to 12 in 1996, right? It was between 10 and 12, but closer to 12, maybe 11.5 or something like that, I don't know. And in 2004, we see that the GDP was about 6. All right, so what's a higher number? 11.5 or 6? Well, obviously 11.5. All right, so basically, you know, there's a bigger, the GDP was higher in 96 than 2004, right? Another way to look at this is if you just kind of draw a line between 1996 population and 2004, it's kind of going to look like this. Now, it's not a perfect line here, but the line would kind of look like this, all right? And if we bring back our stick figure test, right, this little person here starts at the leftmost end and follows the line, they will be going downhill, all right? So this would be a decrease, all right? So what I want you to note here is that, you know, just because at certain times between 1996 and 2004, the graph is increasing, overall, there was still more decrease, all right, than increase, right? So in other words, in 96, the GDP was higher than it was in 2004, although, you know, it went down certain years, it went up certain years, it still overall was a decrease, which is what we're looking for here. So the next question gives us U.S. cities, New York, L.A., Chicago, Houston, and Phoenix. And we see population size in 2002 measured in millions. We see New York was 8.6. LA 4, Chicago 2.6, Houston 2.3, and Phoenix 1.7. And it says, what is the mean population size? So let's have you pause the video. Try your best to figure this out. And as always, if you get stuck, don't worry about it. We'll learn how to do it. 
Okay, so basically, you should know right off the bat that mean, median, mode, and range questions are fair game for social studies. And that surprises a lot of people, but this is on the GED Social Studies Study Guide made by the Official Testing Service. Any textbook that you're going to look in is going to have this listed for social studies, at least as far as I'm aware. I've also heard from several GED test takers that mean, median, mode, and range does come up on their test. So you want to know how to do this for social studies, but you also just in general need to know how to do this because mean, median, mode, and range is fair game for social studies, science, and math. So there's a good chance that you're going to come into this, come up against one of these questions at some point on your test. So the way you find the mean, and note that mean is just another word for average, you're going to add all of these numbers up, okay? So you want to add all these numbers up, and you want to divide by 5. Now, why would I divide by 5 here? Because there are 5 cities on my list. See, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So let me put this in my calculator now. So let me first do 8.6 plus 4. 8.6 plus 4 plus 2.6 plus 2.3 plus 1.7. Okay, so I can simplify this down a bit. This is equal to 19.2 over 5. And all I did was I just added all these numbers up. 8.6 plus 4 plus 2.6 plus 2.3 plus 1.7. So I simplified this all down to 19.2. Now I'm going to divide by 5. So I have my calculator off screen, and I plug this in my calculator, and I get 3.84. Now I don't care if you rounded this. I don't care if you didn't round it. I don't care as long as you got 3.84 or something very close to this. As long as you understand the process here, then consider the question uh, that you got it right. To find the mean, again, you just take all the numbers. You're going to add them up and divide by the total number of numbers in your data set. Here, our data set consists of five places. That's why I divided by 5. 3.84 is the answer here. Okay, so your next question says, what is the median population size? And I just want to thank you so much for sticking with me so far to the video. I just reemphasize that this is important work. And, you know, whether you've studied mean, median, mode, and range, if this is your first time studying it, then hopefully this will be enough to guide you through all those types of questions that you get on that topic for the GED. And if you've studied that topic before, repetition can't hurt because these questions will come up. They're fair game for three out of the four sections. So right now we're finding the median, so I'll turn it over to you. Try to find the median, and when you're ready, just unpause the video and we'll go over it. Okay, so the median is the middle number when the numbers are ordered from smallest to largest. Now, the mean means the average. The median is the middle number when the numbers are ordered from smallest to largest. Now, a lot of people, they remember, maybe from high school or maybe from earlier in their studying or wherever they remember it, a lot of people remember that the median is the middle number. And so they will just kind of look at the list here and they will uh, just look for the middle number. Um, but that's not always going to work. In fact, in many cases that won't work because you have to put them in order from smallest to largest first. All right, now our list here is actually uh, really, if you look, 1.7 to 8.6. This is already kind of going from smallest to largest, but I wrote them out here from smallest to largest anyway. 1.7, 2.3, 2.6, 4, and 8.6. So I simply have to look at the middle number here, all right? And so again, make sure that for the median questions, make sure that you do this. You have to put the numbers in order from smallest to largest first, okay? If you don't do that, then you're not going to get the right answer. So if these, you just take the numbers and just put them in any order you want or in the order that they're given to you, you know, there's no guarantee you're going to get the right answer. You need to put them in order from smallest to largest first, then find the middle number. Now, there's a harder case with median that we're going to look at in just a minute, but this is your very basic case. Okay, your next question is, what is the range? So go ahead and pause the video. Now I'd like you to try to find the range, and then when you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, repetition is always good, so let's go over this so far. The mean means the average. You add up all the numbers in the data set and divide by the total number of numbers. The median is the middle number when you put the numbers in order from smallest to largest. And now the range is the biggest number minus the smallest number. So to get the range, you would find the biggest number in the data set. The biggest number is 8.6, and the smallest number is 1.7. 
okay? And it's, it's perfectly okay to use calculators for this. I don't care whether you use a calculator or how you get the right answer. I'm sure, you know, you could get this, figure this out without using the calculator, but for the sake of time, you know, I just threw this in my calculator right now, and I get 6.9. So again, to find the range, you take the biggest number, and you subtract it by the smallest number, and I get 6.9. So that's how you do a range. Okay, so if you had trouble with the mean or if you got that mean question right, repetition is always helpful. So here's another data set. We've got New York, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Florida. And this time we're looking at estimated populations in the millions in these four states. So I'd like you to calculate the mean now. Like I said, if you got this right before, repetition is only gonna help, it can't hurt. And if you struggled with that question, then now's your chance to get redemption. So how would you find the mean? You can pause the video, try to solve this, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so to find the mean, again, note that mean simply means the average. So to find the average, all you're going to do is you take all the numbers in the data set, and you're going to add them up, and you're going to divide by the total number of numbers here, all right? So how many states do I have? I've got four states. All right, I've got four numbers in my data set. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do, add everything up and divide it all by four. Okay, so my handwriting is really sloppy. Uh, it's better in real life, it's not much better, but writing with this, uh, writing with this whiteboard thing uh, really brings out the worst of my handwriting, so I do apologize for that. Okay, and calculators are a fair game for this question for sure. And as I add this up in my calculator here, uh, let me simplify the top number here. So I add everything up in my calculator, I get 64.8, and I'm going to divide this by four. All right, so if I divide that by four, what I get is 16.2, and of course it's 16.2 million. So hopefully you found this number or something very close to it as the mean. Okay, so the next question here, we're looking at the same data set, but this time the question is, what is the median? So there's a little trickier example of the median, so give it a shot, and whether or not you get the right answer, I don't care. I just want you to learn from this. So let's have you pause the video and try it out. Okay, so hopefully you had a chance to try that if you'd like to. Now, for the median, remember, what is the median? Well, the median is the middle number, when the numbers are ordered from smallest to largest. So what we have to do first is we have to put the numbers in order from smallest to largest. So I have 10.8 and then 12.8 and then 19.3 and then what about 21.9. Okay, so I've got them in order from smallest to largest. So if you remember to do that at least, great work. And, but now we don't have a true middle number, right? We have an even number of numbers. So note that for a median example, if you've got an odd number of numbers that you're working with, you can just simply pick, put them in order from smallest to largest and you can just look at that middle number. When you have an even number of numbers like we do here, you're gonna have to take these first two numbers and you're gonna have to take the average of them. So how do you do that? You would do 12.8 plus 19.3, and you're gonna divide them by two, all right? So again, all you have to do for a question like this is you would just, for median, put them in order from smallest to largest. If it happens to be an even number of numbers, like here we have one, two, three, four numbers that we're working with here, you put them in order from smallest to largest first, and then you add up the two numbers in the middle and divide them by two that will give you the right answer every time. So I just did that at my calculator and I get 16.05 as the median. So if you got that right, really, really great job. And if you didn't get this right, hopefully you learned something from this that will help you in the future. But either way, great job for trying. Okay, sticking with that same data set, I would like you to now tell me what the range is. So feel free to use a calculator, pause the video, try to find the range, and then we'll go over it. So again, the mean means the average, the median is the middle number when the numbers are ordered from smallest to largest, and the range is simply the biggest number in the data set minus the smallest number. So whether or not you used a calculator, hopefully you did 21.9 minus 10.8, and hopefully you got 11.1 .1 million. So the range here is just 11.1 .1 million.
Now let me just talk briefly about the mode. In this data set, we don't have a mode. So the mode is simply the most occurring number in the data set. Now in this case, every single number only occurs one time, so we don't have a mode here. Now let's say that there was some imaginary state, all right, and I don't know if any states have the exact same populations, but let's just say there was some imaginary like state, uh, you know, that had a population of 10.8, just like Georgia, okay? If we had another state that had the same population as Georgia, and we looked at this data set and we saw, hey, there's two numbers, this is supposed to be an eight, by the way. If we looked at our data set and we said, hey, there's two numbers in the data set that both have, that are both 10.8, the mode would be 10.8. Okay, so that's just a little example I just made up off the top of my head. But all you have to do for mode is figure out which number occurs the most. All right, so if this were our data set, and every number showed up once except 10.8, which showed up twice. That would simply be our mode. Okay, so the next passage is the Gettysburg Address, which is a very famous, uh, very famous passage here uh, by... Okay, so next, the next passage is called the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln. And it says, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who have gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we have, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last measure of devotion, that we here highly resolved that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth. Abraham Lincoln, November 19, 1863. Okay, so the question says, what concept is a main idea of this excerpt? A, equality, B, division of labor, C, socialism, or, or sorry, C, capitalism, or D, socialism. So pause the video, take your time with this. When you're ready, we'll go over it. So let's talk quickly about the main idea. Now, the main idea is the main point of the paragraph or passage, and it's usually found in one sentence, although not always, um, and repetition can sometimes cue you into it, all right? And I should mention when it comes to the main idea usually being found in one sentence, that could be a sentence early on in the passage, or sometimes it could be a sentence early on at the end of the passage. It could sometimes be the first sentence. Um, but, you know, there's often going to be one sentence there where they kind of spell out the main idea, although not always in repetition of words or repetition of ideas could kind of cue you into something, like if you saw... Read a paragraph and the author uses the word equality six or seven times in it. Probably that's a clue that the main idea is going to have something to do with equality. Um, another way to think about it is to read a paragraph or passage and then just ask yourself, uh, what title would I give this? What would I name this passage? And, you know, sometimes asking yourself that question can kind of help you clarify what the main idea is. So just a little bit of uh, background on what the main idea is and a couple of tips and tricks here to find it. Now let's uh, get back in and let's look at the answer to this question. Okay, so one little trick here that I want to show you for finding the main idea. This sometimes works for other questions besides main idea. But if you can find words in the passage that match words in an answer choice... There's a good chance that, you know, that's a safe guess, all right? Now, I don't want you guessing on the test. I obviously want you to try to think critically and answer the questions based off of reading comprehension and critical thinking. But my point here is that, you know, if you notice words in the passage, like here we see the word equal, 
and we see an answer choice that says equality. Simply finding, you know, answer choices that have words that match words in the passage. All right, that can be that can help you find the right answer. Right now, it's not always going to work. It's not a guarantee that this is always going to work. Okay, sometimes you might see a word in the passage, and that word might be the same as an answer choice. And then answer choice might be wrong. So it's not always going to work, but it is a trick I want to kind of throw out here in this video to give you. That is, again, look for words in the passage that match words in the answer choices. But basically, all these things, division of labor, capitalism, socialism, they don't come up in this passage. The passage is talking about here, you know, everyone being created equal. It's talking about the Civil War, which was fought for, in, in uh, you know, freeing the slaves and was fought essentially for equality and people to have equal rights. And so, you know, if we read this closely and think about it, you know, we're talking about people that have died and given their lives for freedom and for equality. Um, we'll see that a main idea of this extra is equality. And we can also verify that by simply matching, finding the word equal and seeing that, you know, the word in the passage here matches the word in the answer choice. So again, I just want to say this one more time here, you know, this trick does not always work just because you see an answer choice in a, uh, that, you know, has a word in it that matches a word in the passage. That doesn't guarantee that answer choice is going to be correct. If you are stuck on the question and have to guess, you know, that's probably a safe guess. 